Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 191, The Life Cycle of a Board Gamer. I'm Sean, and with you and here with me live, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, helping you make your game nights better. We record Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop. And it would be awesome if you joined us here live on Twitch. So tonight we're going to be talking about the life cycle of a board gamer, starting sharing the path we took through the hobby and where we are now. After that, we've got a detailed review of mountains out of molehills, and we wrap up with our usual weekend review. Welcome to the suggestion box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Up first, a comment, uh, Jen, who commented on our episode about ugly games that play really well today. Race for the Galaxy, by far my top vote for ugly games. <laughs> oh, it's been a bit, so I can't remember if this made our list of, uh, of ugly games that we still enjoy, uh, but it's a good choice either way, whether we had it or not. Um, well, the card art is fine. I don't actually mind that at all. It's the iconography. It's far too overwhelming for any new players. And even once you learn it, it just doesn't all make sense. Like you learn what the icons mean, but not necessarily what they really represent. Great game, though, um, especially with the first trilogy of expansions, which, of course, adds in even more icons. Well, thanks for the comment, Jen. Well, next up, a critique of our This Didn't Happen preview on YouTube. Kyle Smith writes, a top view of setup would have helped. Well, thanks for the comment, Kyle. Uh, we like to say we like uh, we'll 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 uh, look at your comments, positive or negative, and this is more obviously a negative one. So, a couple things though with this, and and I wasn't sure how to reply to this. So, the first thing is a technical issue. Top down shots of games are something that are not easy for us to do because of our current setup. My game room has a drop ceiling, and I have a very big table. So it's both hard to get a wide enough shot that gets the whole game in and even harder, it's harder to get on top of the table to take the picture without like kneeling on it or something. I don't have any overhead bars or anything like that. For any of you who remember our Gloomhaven streams, even then we didn't do full top down. We kind of did a three quarters angle and that's the best we could get. Now, the other thing, though, is, is this really a problem? Like, clearly Kyle thought so, but I don't think we need top-down views as for reviews. Because as we said before, we do reviews here, not how to play videos. Yes, we do give an overview of how to play, but that's so that people understand and can kind of learn what the game's about, so they can make their own decision if they sound like it has mechanics they like and things they enjoy. But our videos are not meant to be instructional in any way. So maybe I'm off base. Maybe I should try to get more top-down shots and more shots useful for learning the game, like a shot of how to set things up. Because if that's the case, I don't even take a picture at the beginning, like here's the start of the game. Here's the end of the game. Here's the score track. I don't even get those. Uh, do you have any thoughts on this, Sean? Well, I think there are plenty of content creators out there already who provide pretty and interesting views of games. And while that's mm -hmm. great, it's never been our focus. Now, that's not to say we can't improve what we do, of course. Mm. But to me, overhead shots aren't how normal people experience a game while playing. Yeah. And as a result, not as, um, I don't want to say necessarily useful, but not as uh, valid for the type of content we produce. Yeah. Um, if we had the space, there are certainly things I would love to do differently or even more things we could add. But we need a few more patrons to get our own dedicated studio space. Just just a few. We're, we're really close, really. Um, now what I want to know, actually, I'm sure everyone saw this coming, is some more feedback on this. Uh, like Kyle's one one case. And I tend to think if I have one person saying it, there's probably 100 that are thinking it, not saying anything. So is this something we should even be worried about? Like, I, I guess we could start doing how to play videos, but it's not what we currently do. And honestly... There's people out there that do a fantastic job of this way better than I think we could even do even with years of experience. I'm not interested in trying to compete with the Rodney Smiths, Paul Grogan's and Becca Scott's of the world and any of the other instructional video makers out there. Well, last, a rare comment from our tabletop gaming deals side of tabletop bellhop. Matt Schwink emailed to say, what is up with Amazon out of nowhere having like the best board game sale of the year? I don't know how you keep up with it. The sale seems so random, but the prices have been great. Thanks for all your hard work. Not all heroes wear capes. 
that we get the superhero reference now. All right, thanks for that, Matt. Um, I gotta say, it takes a significant amount of time investment to keep up with these sales. I'm sure far more than most people expect we spend on such things. Now, the sale Matt's talking about, at least as of today, Wednesday, October 26th, is still going strong. And I have a pretty good idea for those of you listening at home, it's still going strong. Um, it's lasted a full week at this point and features huge coupons. There's a coupon in there for $50 off a game. Uh, this has led to some of the all-time greatest prices on games. Um, unfortunately, I sold out today. Isle of Cats was one I was going to call out. Funko's Rear Window, Azul Queen's Garden, the latest Azul game, and even the newest edition of Betrayal at House in the Hill are all at all-time low prices. And I say, for anyone catching this live or soon after, check the Amazon coupon landing page at tabletopbellhop.com. And I still have some a pretty good idea that even if you wait till Tuesday, it's still going to be there. That's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback by commenting on our posts, emailing mo at tabletopbellhop.com, sending us a message, or tagging us on social media. We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. Tonight's question comes from Patreon and patron Razul502, who asks, what different stages of the hobby have you experienced? What are your favorite games or memories from these stages? I'm asking because I'm curious about the long-term journey. I've mm -hmm. been in the hobby for almost five years. My collection has increased to around 150, and my game style preference has changed many times. Currently, I'm more interested in decking out my games that I really enjoy instead of just constantly adding new games to the shelf. Great question there, Raswell. Um, and honestly, all of those steps sound very familiar to me. I personally have decided, I don't know, I, I just decided to coin a bunch of terms this episode because uh, feel free to use these or make up your own. Um, I decided to call this the... The game collection and style change, I mean, we're going to call it the life cycle of a board gamer. Uh, and it's something, honestly, every gamer goes through um, from whenever they first discover the hobby to wherever they are now. And there are many ups, downs, steps forward, steps backs, and sometimes loops on this journey. It's most definitely not a straight line, and the path isn't going to be the same for everyone. While there are some commonalities and there seem to be a few paths that many people take, mm -hmm. each gamer and game group is going to experience things differently. And then as well as not following the same path, the actual stops along the path may very well be different. And the end is going to vary where it stops or where they are now. Some groups have a very short journey, while others are still evolving with what they enjoy and the games they play are constantly changing. What we're going to talk about today is our paths, as well as mention other paths people we know have taken and some common paths that most gamers seem to follow. Mm -hmm. The important thing to note is that none of this has to be your path, and we may well miss the exact journey you or your group has had. And none of these paths are any better than any other. I think that's important to stress. Now, no matter what part, path you take it all starts by taking that single step and getting into the board game hobby everyone has to start somewhere whether that's playing games as kids and never really leaving the hobby or discovering it much later in life now i'm one of those people who never really had a distinct point where i became a hobby gamer my dad was always into games and even hobby board games before they were really called that this was like they he was into squad leader and up front as well as early Avalon Hill, 3M, and Sports Illustrated. Uh, back then, they weren't called designer games or hobby games. They're called bookshelf games because you stored them this way instead of being the long, flat, you know, Parker Brothers boxes. For me, I just grew up with games being a thing and, like, weird, strange games being a thing. Now, if I did have to pick a point from where I basically swapped from playing mass market kids games or just traditional card games to what most people would consider hobby games, that would be when I picked up a copy of Talisman at Leisure World at the Devonshire Mall, and that's what really led me on my current beer game journey. Sean, what about you? I know we played games together as a kid, but those were pretty much all mass market from what I remember. Indeed, I really knew nothing but mass market board games for really most of my, you know, uh, life up until uh, full adulthood. Uh, I was aware of some of those fancy games your dad liked. <laughs> 
uh, but they seem so incredibly niche and uncommon. Yeah. Uh, my family did love games. Uh, we played regularly more so than most families I knew. Uh, and while mass market, there was a wide range over multiple decades in our collection mm -hmm. uh, that we, you know, it, it felt like a board game collection, even though it was technically more mass market. Uh, nowadays, I'm assuming the path of the lifelong gamer, right? The the you were born into it and your parents played is probably a lot more normal than when Sean and I were growing up. Um, like I've met younger gamers that are like, oh, yeah, my parents played Catan. Or, yeah, they play Ticket to Ride. I've been playing Ticket to Ride Christmas Eve for as long as I can remember. And while the growing number of people whose parents play D&D &D continues to grow as well. Yeah, gone are the days where Parker Brothers games from the Sears catalog are the only board games that families played. Yeah. Uh, next up for me is what I like to call the dark times. I uh, stopped playing. Stopped playing board games, hobby games, stopped playing RPGs, completely got out of it, except for, you know, the occasional nostalgia-fueled game of Talisman, usually with some alcohol involved. Um, and, well, I kept trying to get back into Warhammer Fantasy Battle. I don't know how many different times I tried to get back in, especially when they opened the Games Workshop store locally. Uh, but mainly, I didn't play tabletop games. I played a lot of video games, an awful lot, uh, with the PlayStation, the PlayStation 2, and uh, Nintendo 64 and all those. Now, I gotta say, I think this step's pretty common for most gamers, as long as they got into it as kids, right? It's not just you hit that stage in life where you're no longer hanging out with your old friends and the, the kids you grew up with, and you're meeting new people and new groups, uh, your people move away. Uh, people get jobs, they start becoming adults, people are getting married, maybe kids happen, and generally your priorities shift. Yeah, for me, it was university. Uh, I went away to university, I left Windsor and uh, moved up to Toronto. And while I'd already become an RPG fan before university and played some a little bit during first year university, afterwards, it was digital or nothing. Uh, between yeah. school and jobs, it was usually the computer, which was the go-to for relaxing mind-numbing fun after a long day uh board games just weren't even at all in the equation i mean never never even crossed the mind yeah and i was pretty much the same i said every now and then it'd be like hey we should get together and play talisman because we haven't done that in a long time uh next up is what i would call the rediscovery phase which for me happened when I, we were pretty settled down in life like i things were still tumultuous and you were young and stupid but Dee and I were living together. We had our own apartment. I had a steady job. Dee was taking classes at school. And while well, disposable income was actually a thing that we were discovering for the first time in life. And we finally realized maybe we shouldn't spend it all on pictures of beer and pool downtown. Um, here, we discovered Catan, specifically due to buying a games magazine before a trip up to London, Ontario on the bus and going, I'm going to buy whatever's the number one game of all time because it was a game's top 10 and it was this game Catan. That led to weekly game nights. Now, I've talked about this part of my gaming life many times, so I'm not going to into the details, but we played a lot of Catan and then Catan with expansions. And then I imported stuff for Germany for Catan. Like behind me, I've got my copy of Das Book, which is now like super rare and out of print. Um, we played a lot of Catan, as well as rediscovering some of the classic games in my collection. Uh, and of course, another attempt to get back into Warhammer Fantasy Battle, <laughs> uh, which uh, is when I started collecting. And, and we, we actually played a few matches this time instead of me just buying lots of miniatures. Yeah. And for me, it was quite a bit later when you and I reconnected uh, mm -hmm. after I'd stopped traveling and uh, we actually had bought our first home. Uh, I was I was actually available to, you know, have friends come over and had a place to have have people come over and visit. Uh, and with games being such a big part of your life already it was just mm. something i uh, i accepted as easily as when i had taken up role playing uh earlier in our friendship you know you you had you were you had already been involved in role playing and when we and we had reconnected after a short grade school uh separation and uh i jumped into role playing and well after the adult separation you were board gaming so i just started board gaming too yeah yeah, that was one of that at that, that time. Heck, even now I bring games anywhere I go. And I'm just like, well, of course we're going to sit down. But what else are we going to do? Sit around <laughs> and talk? Well, we can do that over a game. <laughs> Why would we just talk? Yep. Now, again, I think this is pretty typical, at least for anyone who took the path where they're on their way and got out and then came back. Um, and I got to say, Catan is where, man, I, I feel um, 
not hipster, but like, yeah, I'm, I'm just one of the pack, right? <laughs> this, is, this is pretty much a trope that people discover or get, get back into the hobby because of, of Catan and realize that, oh, these are better than the games I played as a kid. And yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm one of those. I, Catan is partially responsible for this. See, and this is where uh, I widely diverge. Uh, I never really played Catan until much later and never really saw the fun in it when I did get to it. <laughs> um, while it's hard to say for sure, obviously, if Catan had been the gateway for me, I might have actually been turned off of gaming. Uh, instead, you showed up at my house with a box of different games to show me. Yeah. And then this is the stage that, that I didn't go through, but Sean went through that I would call the, oh, wow, board games are actually fun stage. <laughs> Sean got to do this. I didn't. This is where you, you, someone who wouldn't call themselves a gamer somehow discovers hobby board games and goes, wow, these are actually fun, right? A friend brings a game over. You go to a board game cafe for the first time. You decide to go into a local game store or maybe the local comic book shop has a gaming night or the library. There are lots of ways to find hobby board gaming. And basically, it's the same as me rediscovering the hobby. But instead of rediscovering, it's discovering it for the first time. Now, again, Catan gets a lot of credit for this. Uh, more recently, I think uh, Ticket to Ride gets called out more often than Catan nowadays. And the one I'm seeing a lot of anymore is Wingspan being the first gateway for people. Now, I'm not calling it a gateway game. That sounds kind of gatekeepy, but it's the gateway to board gaming. We're going to use it that way. And I know gamers who got hooked on all kinds of games as their first game. Yeah, because because Wingspan is not a simple game by no. any means. It's <laughs> no. not what generally is considered a gateway game as an as an easy introduction to the hobby at all. No, I um, wouldn't say so. But I think it was Zuloretto uh, was the one I remember. I know you had a milk crate full, but Zuloretto yep. was the one I, I seem to recall. Yeah, I've been trying to remember what I brought, because if I remember correctly, Zuloretto was definitely the one we played. But I think I actually picked that up that day. At 401 Games, because I think it was one of those, we went up to Toronto, you and Sherry were working, and you weren't home, so like we hit downtown first and then made it to your place for dinner, and then played games after dinner. And I think that's what happened, I actually bought Zuloretto that day. Now, I cannot remember for the life of me what else I brought. I'm, I'd have to assume it was probably Carcassonne and Catan, but who knows? Yeah, it was uh, a rather eventful weekend for various unexpected yes. reasons. Uh, and the games did get overshadowed by events that really aren't appropriate to be discussed here. True. But uh, I, I, Zuloretto was, I think, the one we got to the table first. Yeah. So it definitely sticks out uh, before uh, events. All right. Next up for me and many other people is the Pokemon stage where you got to catch them all. Um, this sounds like where Razuel is right now. Uh, this one's extremely common in the hobby, and you're going to see it a lot. But the whole acquisition disorder that's meant jokingly, not that it's an actual disorder, um, the, the whole must get games is very much a, a certain type of gamer that gets into that. And they're also the certain types of gamer who like to go online and talk about it. And the certain type of gamer who likes to show up at game night and show off their new stuff. Right. Uh, this is not the average gamer, in my opinion. It's the average gamer you hear about. These people, I will say potentially not neurodivergent, who fixate on things, love data and stats and knowing more. The, the traditional geek, right? The geek, the nerd, whatever. Uh, as usual, part of this stage is you find board game geek. That, that's, that's like a thing that all gamers eventually do. And then once you get there, you see that there's ranks. And then you find the top 100 and you see the hot list. And you start trying to find more information about these games. I think a little more common, like for me, that was like 2003. Um, this is also where nowadays you're going to have podcasts, top tens, board game, YouTube channels and Twitch streams. And while people like us are going to come in and be like, hey, you should check out this new thing. And you're like, oh, that sounds great. I must go get it. Now, we know you like games. You want more games like those games. So you start to research what are the games you may like, and then you go shopping. All I really have to say about this one is I own over 1,500 games, and I'm just talking board games, not role-playing games. Uh, the acquisition distorter hit me hard, and it's something I still deal with. Um, while we may not be reviewing the new hotness every week, I still pay attention to what that hotness is, and I got to admit, there's lots I would be tempted to buy. I would say it's not surprising that many hobby board games involve collecting things, and board games themselves 
are often collectors. Now, while I will often go all in on a specific game, like I did mm. with DC deck building, uh, I thankfully haven't had the urge to go full Pokedex. Yeah. Uh, though that may in part be due to the sizable collection that I can play over at your house. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Access to games will change that. Now, this gotta buy them all phase does happen to most groups, but usually it's one person in each group for the reason Sean just mentioned. These tend to be the collectors, right? The hobbyists, the people who take it a bit more seriously than everyone else. I honestly don't think, though, that this is the average stage for an average gamer, the person on the street, the person comes to the house and plays games with you. But it's a very common stage for a certain subset of gamers, which are the ones we're usually interacting with pretty regularly online. It also hopefully tends to be the one who has the most disposable income available to use for a hobby like this. Yes. And it's not a debt uh, incursion. Yes. Uh, be careful with the gotta catch them all stage that you do not overspend. All right. This leads to the next stage, which I'm going to call the curation. This is when you got enough games that you need to start organizing them better. You become more discerning in what you buy. You don't just buy games because they're a good deal, and you start to do research before buying your games. You'll look at a game you're considering buying and then think, hey, do I have anything in my collection that already scratches the same itch? Similarly, you're going to look at your collection kind of on the other way, though, and on the buying side and go, wait, do I, am I missing anything? Like, do I have a good auction game? I don't have a good auction game. Maybe I should pick one up. So this is the point where you stop buying. You're just being a little more careful about what you buy. This also leads to the world of shelfies, debates on storage forms, shelving, how to shelve your games, sometimes even to even more niche forms like box optimizations, game repackaging, custom inserts, or even if you've got the ability, custom components. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm pretty sure this is a step everyone reaches at some point, uh, though for some people it can take a long time to get there um, for a very long time. Every time Amazon had a buy two, get one free sale um, and I had a Han Solo, I would buy 12 new games on average every sale, if not more. Um, sure, I checked Board Game Geek to make sure they're not like a five or less, but as long as they were like a seven, I just bought them. I wasn't worried about having two similar games in my collection. Just wanted more games. I wanted to try them all. There was that point, like when you're a little kid and you go into like a bookstore for the first time and you see the proprietor and you wonder if they've read all the books. And you think that's an actual possibility that can happen. That happens with board games where you're like, oh, I want to play them all. I want to try every board game that was ever made. It's not going to happen. And at the time, I wanted a huge collection, too. Like, right, there's a bit of ego here. I, I wanted to be able to brag. Go, hey, I have 500 games. That's more than this person on Reddit. Uh, and while some people don't ever leave this stage, I do think it does eventually hit everyone, whether you think it will or not. If you can afford it, at least. Yes. No, you can always get that. We've talked about it on the show. I'm not going to get into it, but you can always get someone else to buy the games for you. That does work for some groups. Now, another stage or maybe subset of the curation stage, Sean kind of alluded this to, to this a bit, is what I'm going to call the bling stage. It's where you realize you have enough games. Now, Razuel's right there. He mentioned it right in his question. I got enough games. How about instead I make the games I own better? You're doing box inserts, custom meeple, metal coins, uh, main, uh, score sheets, reference cards, big boxes that fit all the expansions, buying expansions, getting all the expansions, getting the fan created content, getting print and play add ons, going and getting to cons to get the special promo that's only available at Essen. There are countless ways you can improve the games you already have. To me, this is a stage all about enjoying the games you know you love and making them more fun. And honestly, this is like a happy place. This is a good stage to be in, in my opinion. Yeah, this can be, but isn't always related to the curation stage in my mind. Uh, often as part of the curation, you're looking to improve what it is you're keeping to help add value to it for your collection. Yes. Now, the bling stage seems to be a hit or miss thing. I, to me, it's not average, it, but it seems to hit some people hard. Some people get there and others never do, but like locally, except for miniature gamers who are all about collecting the nicest army and customization and magnets and all that stuff. And there's a lot of that that happens in Windsor, especially with 3D printing nowadays. There aren't a lot of people who bling out their games. 
There are a couple of us, uh, but most locals I find are more interested in spending their money on new games. The blingers are out there, though. Just one look at Etsy and type board game or a component upgrade, you can see just how popular improving existing games has become. Yeah, and the and the, the huge growth in 3D printing has really driven this. Yes. Uh, and I know, I mean, heck, I'm, I'm a sucker. I've played... Um, uh, that card the new card game from garfield once twice with you yes. and i get i have a full set of wooden tokens and dials to to play it with it <laughs> yeah yeah keyforge Key Key yeah that is something I miss. i'm sorry we're failing here because razo actually asked for specific games at each stage uh for bling for me it was box inserts i definitely did a bunch of box inserts for games i enjoy but one of the ones i blinged out was lords of Waterdeep. i went and got the D and Deeples. I went and got the box insert that fits the expansion and other. So there's an example of a game that I went and blinged out. Yeah, for me, Keyforge. Uh, but then I also made sure I went out and got the uh, the full expanded multiverse box for DC so that I could properly right. manage and maintain all the cards. And then I've got the playmat, another playmat coming and a new multiverse box there coming with the Kickstarter um that yep. uh, that just ran so my bling is uh dc card collecting there you go now another stage that the blingers love but non-blingers do as well as the show it off phase now you have all these games you want to share them with others uh this could start right when you discover it could be the first time you play it, you're like oh my god Catan's awesome i must tell all my friends that that was me I was like, I'm going to invite different people over every weekend. Well, I'm going to start with like, okay, the three of us. It was me, Dean, Sean Skolak, not Sean Hamilton or Sean from Hamilton. Um, we're playing Catan and we're like, oh, this is good. Let's invite someone else. And I think it was Snail Runs in the chat who joined us first. And they're like, okay, this is too good. Oh, there's an expansion. We can play five to six players. Okay, now we're going to invite uh, a Mike over and someone else. And And then we're like, okay, we need two copies so that we can have two tables going at our Catan night because more people have to discover this. And then I'm like, you know, we could like get together at the Knights of Columbus and I could teach people to play Catan. Though at that point, I was also into Power Grid really big. Um, the World of Warcraft board game was big and that that was in 2003. Um, I started running public events. Um, this could happen right away or it could happen once you start collecting, when you're trying to buy them all you want to show them off or once you're curating, especially if you curate, you got to show off this curated collection or if you bling, right? Um, once I, I like I founded the Windsor Gaming Resource, I started hosting game nights so I could tell more people about this hobby. I, I became an ambassador of board yeah. games. And well, I'm still here talking about it. So, yeah, some people just go and show their friends. You, on the other hand, went out, made new friends and found complete strangers to yep. show your games off to. Now, this is likely a personality type outside of the norm where the average person would just bug your, your friends to play every new game you got. Yep. Yeah, I, I'll admit it. <laughs> I'll admit it. Now, of all the things mentioned so far, um, this one definitely probably is a step that not everyone's going to take, right? Uh, it does take a certain type of personality to want to show off your hobby to the world. Um, while I'm sure every gamer is going to hit a point where they're going to want to share their games, many are going to stop once they find friends. Now, I got to say, like, if this goes back to the original start of this where i was talking about how i got started was my dad had a collection well the sad thing about my dad's collection is he didn't have anyone to play with there were there were he had a couple people to play with but not enough and i think knowing my dad had this collection of at the time over a hundred bookshelf games which was massive and un, unheard of and oh my god most dad has so many games but couldn't find anyone anyone to play i didn't want that to happen to anyone else and i used the bad trope i used to say the windsor gaming resource was getting gamers out of their basements right i'd no longer use that term but it was just the goal was to get people out gaming with other people and get those games played. For me, I wanted more. But that's not going to be for everyone. Uh, just about the only thing Mo didn't do is start his own FLGS, though I'm not certain it didn't strongly cross his mind. Yeah, we uh, we tried to make an offer on Hugh Munin to Ian when he decided to close the shop, and <laughs> it did not go through. So yes, that definitely happened. <laughs> and I wish it had gone through at this point. I think it might have turned out pretty good. Now, another stage that for me hit near the end of my got them by them all stage is the con goer stage, um, which could maybe like a smaller version would be the public play stage. This is when you not only game with your small group of friends, but start gaming with strangers, whether that's not necessarily just like to show off your games. This isn't it's a different thing. It's I want to play more games with more people. I want to spend more time gaming. I want to learn 
more games and strategies. It's more that feeling than a, hey, look at my stuff. Now, this could be a local gaming event or store, but generally this tends to eventually get to gaming conventions. Once you're looking at conventions, though, there is a lot more to it than just playing games, right? There are lots of reasons to go to conventions other than just showing off your games or playing games. They're a great place to learn about new games, a place to try before you buy, a place to go shopping, a place to find hard or out of print, hard to find or out of print games, or even better, in my opinion, one of my best things is a place to hang out with like-minded people and talk about games. There are actually a lot of paths, I feel, that lead to this one. Uh, yeah. For me, going to cons was always pretty natural because conventions were something that I attended regularly for work as staff mm. in a wide variety of fields from uh, finance to supercomputing to gaming and uh, tech, you know, uh, public tech, tech cons. Uh, it was just what people who liked something got together and did. That yep. just made sense to me. Now, I know many gamers who never hit this point, but I also know a ton that once they attend their first con, they never look back and try to attend more and more. Uh, many people in groups have set cons they attend every year. They obviously hit these ones. Uh, personally, we were just at that point of having a set of cons we always attended and trying to hit more every year when uh, the COVID pandemic hit. And while we're still in the middle of it this stage, so we only really started hitting cons. It was either 2015 or 2016. I meant to check that stat before I, we went live. It was Origins was our first big one. But like, yeah, I'd gone to Windsor Gaming Fest. But like, that's not a real con. <laughs> no offense to old gamers who ran the Windsor Gaming Fest that were that old. They're probably 18 at the time. Felt old to me because I was like eight. Uh, <laughs> but I think most gamers hit a point in their gaming life where they at least consider going to cons and end up having to make a decision whether to go or not. Yeah, one of the biggest stopping points with cons is people. Uh, mm. I know I struggle with crowds and board games are one of those hobbies that you can enjoy quietly with a few close friends and stepping mm -hmm. up to a place where there could be hundreds or even thousands of other excited gamers can be a big and sometimes overwhelming step. Mm -hmm. I honestly, for the, the average gamer, I suggest you try it. If you're not overly comfortable with crowds, like you're okay with it, go with your group, go there to play games, go to the demo room, do, yeah. do, shop together, right? Don't don't venture into the crowds without your support network. Yeah, but go but again, with if your you're support not, network and enjoy. Yeah. <laughs> and, but again, I'm not trying to gatekeep this. Like you don't have to go to cons to be a real gamer. None of this. Told you as I, as we said at the start, this is not a the proper path, the one true way to do things. But I do encourage anyone who hasn't done a con who is at least interested, give it a shot. The next up. Uh, up is the the dreaded purge a word that makes some board gamers run away and scream in terror uh this is when you keep curating right and you're curating and curating and then something snaps or maybe it clicks maybe it's a light bulb turning on you suddenly realize i don't need all the games anymore not only do you watch what you buy you start to remove games from your collection you look at the games your own and start realizing, I haven't played that in years. Sometimes, for some people, this means getting rid of almost everything. Just keeping a small core group of games you love. Note a small core group could be 100 or more. Um, for others, though, this means following some kind of one-in, one-out system. If I buy a new game, I'm going to get rid of an old one. For me, this stage hit once I ran out of room for new games. I honestly, up until that point, was like, why would I get rid of any of these? I got room. Like, if nothing else, I can sit back and go, wow, look at all the games. And I feel good. I feel happy looking around my game room, looking at my collection. I have a big game room. I have 12 six-foot bookshelves down there, not counting a couple cabinets as well. But once those were completely full, including stacks on top, and I had a pile of games that were starting to build up on a chair that I couldn't put away. It started to make a lot more sense to get rid of games I no longer played. Now, the interesting thing I found about this stage is though, while it took a long time to get there and even longer to finally get rid of that first game, once I got rid of that first one, it became easier and easier as time went on. I think the big thing was realizing those first few games I got rid of, I didn't miss. Now, I personally have a long way to go here. I've got probably 100 games sitting here beside me in this room that are on the chopping block. Uh, my big problem hasn't been that I don't want to get rid of them. It's been the pandemic and time. 
finding time to check the games to make sure they're complete, figuring out reasonable prices, listing for sale, figuring out somewhere to meet up with people. And it just it's, it feels insurmountable at this time with everything else going on. So I, I think at the beginning of this, uh, this little section here, you described yourself as a board game dragon. Dragon, uh, there sitting, you go. sitting there and staring at your hoard and enjoying <laughs> the fact that you have this gleaming hoard of board games in front of you. Uh, There's probably a parallel there. But now also, uh, when it comes to the purge, Canada is a smaller market with more expensive shipping. So taking advantage of things like eBay or board game geek deals and math trades can be harder here, mm -hmm. which makes the purge portion more difficult because no yes. one wants to throw out a game. I mean, getting rid of the game is one thing, but throwing it out is un unthinkable for the majority of people unless it's, uh, you know, horribly damaged beyond. Yes. Um, I hear I'm going to throw in a stage here that's going to horrify people even more than the purge. And that is the recycle the cardboard for the expansions. There's a stage some people are scared to death of. Yeah, I did that right away. I, that was yeah, <laughs> see, Sean had no problem with that. <laughs> went one. into the multiverse box and all the cardboard went away. Oh, I, I had friends that were so disturbed I did it. They asked for all my boxes <laughs> so they could protect them, um, which I think got turned into art projects. Yes, hoarding empty boxes. Uh, my big one right now is X-Wing ship things, the plastic things, because honestly, they are the best way to protect the ships, but they are taking up a ridiculous amount of room in my 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 uh, laundry room. <laughs> and I'm like, I probably should just get rid of them. Like, my ships are mostly in a miniature carrying case now. Am I really going to go and put them back into all these plastic things? But then I'm like, if I ever decide to sell them, and that's the thing you always think, right? That that's what catches these people who are like, what if I ever want to sell that expansion? I'm like, well, how are you storing it? Is it in your base box? I'm pretty sure whoever gets it's going to be happy with it in your base box. And yes, there's going to be people out there like, what? It doesn't come with the expansion box. There's lots of other. As, as I said before, those, those those Uber gamers, the people who take things that seriously are not the majority. They just happen to be pretty loud, like us. Anyway, that was that was a side path. That was a, <laughs> a divergent path of, of recycling cardboard. Um. Now the purge, I believe it or not. I know people are out there. I, I denied it for a long time. I think everyone does get there at some point, uh, whether they expect it. Now, some people get to it way before I did. Um, we talked about Neil and his group of gamers on the podcast a few times, though it's been a long time. He is the big board game buyer for the group, picks what they're going to play, and they have, I can't remember exactly, they have an exact number of games. We're going to say it's five in their collection at one time, but they go all out on those five games. They play multiple times a week and they bling these out as much as possible and make sure to get all the things. This includes house rules, promos, um, any little thing that like fan made print and play 3D printed, whatever. These games become their lives until they're sick of them. Then they sell that game off and replace it with a new one. Now, because of all the work Neil does blinging these games out, usually makes money on all these games. He literally like makes a profit every new game he does, and that funds their next game and makes Neil a little bit of money on the side. For example, Scythe, right? We review Scythe. We're all really enjoying Scythe. Well, I finally post about Scythe. He's like, it's about time you turn around on Scythe, because I admitted that, that was part of my first place. The Scythe weren't so great, because well, I played with the super blinged out extra, all the extras in it version. They had played Scythe 55 times before doing the Rise of Fenry campaign, which they enjoyed enough, they bought a second copy and did twice. They had every expansion. They had the metal coins. They had box inserts, the big box, the play mats. They were eventually done with Scythe. Sold it all for more than enough to get them the next game they were into. Not my path, but that is definitely a path. This is, of course, a unique, some might say, fixation. Not all groups are going to be able to or want to focus in so narrowly. But for them, it works and it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. It's not a bad way to do it. I actually know a lot of people with the in and out. They 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 get their clay, they purge till they get to whatever arbitrary number they pick. And then it's it, it's when one come game comes in, one goes out. I think even Tom Vassell does that. Now, for most folks listening right now, you probably haven't reached this stage yet, but we'll get there eventually. Assuming you ever got the acquisition. <laughs> You know, got to buy them all. If you're if you're just a game player and not a buyer, you don't have to worry about this one so much. Now, even the people I know with collections multiple times larger than mine. Yes, there are some. And yeah, they're in Windsor. 
they purge. Uh, for one of them, it's a once a year thing. They sit down once a year. It's a January thing. It's like, you know, start of the new year, let's purge. And another, it's just kind of like uh, they look on their shelf and go, man, I haven't played that in forever and I have no desire to time to get rid of it. The key I find is to keep things that, uh, to not keep things that don't make you happy. Too many games, games you don't like, games that ended poorly, games that broke up friendships. Uh, get rid of them. Uh, too many games making you feel anxious. Get rid of some. Thanks, Marie Kondo. <laughs> that to be fair, I've been doing a lot of personal purging, not games, but in my life recently as part of this move. So yeah. that's just kind of by, been my uh, mindset of late. Lost Cities Rivals. Does it spark joy? No. Not even a little bit. <laughs> not even a little bit. <laughs> um game examples there's one like i said i have a hundred in here i i am now constantly one of the like like not a hobby but like when i'm sitting downstairs waiting for something whatever that happens to be like like i'm waiting for d to come down or one we're playing a game and someone goes to the bathroom or someone's got really bad ap i now look around my room and i'm evaluating everything i'm looking at and, and i'm thinking oh, it's been so long or the, the opposite oh man it's been too long since we played that what I really would love to do, there's just not enough time in the world, is I want to play everything in my collection once and decide if it stays or goes. Like just starting at A, play them all and go, okay. Some I don't even need to. I can literally just purge them now. But there's enough that are like, you still like that. Would I still like it? Or man, you know what? I've had that game for 12 years. I played it once, but it was good. We just never went back to it. Is it really good? Or should I just get rid of it? I, I, I would love to do that. Next up, we have a stage that I haven't reached, at least not yet, and that's the quit. You've had enough. You're done. I, I don't want to play hobby games anymore. Purge your complexion. All of it. All gone. Now, this can happen for a number of reasons, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. So I got to say, every gamer you tell it to is probably going to feel a little sad. You may be that you find you just don't have time, right? You're not playing them. You're looking at your games. You're like, when's the last time we had a game night? Maybe you have other obligations. You're busy with other things. You realize, you know, it's games. There are more important things I can spend my time on. Or you just can't afford it anymore. Now, in general, that's not that bad because it's not like the games you already own, uh, you know, are no longer playable. Uh, maybe you're just sick of feeling you're missing out the FOMO. A lot of people I've noticed are getting out of the hobby because they feel they can't keep up. They can't keep up with all the Kickstarters and all the expansions and all the miniatures and get everything painted. And it's just too much and it becomes an anxiety issue for them and they quit. Now, hopefully the issue isn't community related, though I, like things seem to be a lot more diverse and welcoming than they were, say, even 10 years ago. But I think we can all admit there's still a long way to go. So I hope no one's chased anyone out of the hobby, but I know what happens. Now, the main thing here is there are lots of valid reasons for exiting the hobby, and no one should judge anyone based on the decision to do so. It could be as simple as using your board game collection to finance a new stage in your life. Got a baby coming? You can pay for a lot with those 1,500 board games. <laughs> yeah. Now, another step along the path is what I want to call the Epicurean or the taster, maybe the visitor. You want to try all the things. Now, this is similar to Got to Catch Them All and can be part of the same phase for some people like me. Um, but I've seen this actually more on non-collectors, non-game buyer buyers, people who attend public play events, game nights at friends and cons just to try new games. They have no interest in building a game collection of their own, but love playing games and discovering new games. Now, if you're the collector in your group, the rest of your group, it likely falls into this category. And I think the average board gamer, the, the people who consume media instead of create it, fall in here as well. They love games, always looking to try new games, but it's something they just enjoy doing and nothing more. Yeah, I came to this stage, uh, I guess, a little un unnaturally. Uh, it just kind of comes as being part of being friends with Mo. <laughs> yeah, I, I force my friends to be Epicureans. Well, they have the option not to game. Be like, hey, I don't want to play anything new, but I'm going to be like, hey, we're playing new games this weekend. Especially <laughs> I'm going to push you into the podcast, so I can't. Yes. Uh, I definitely, definitely have to uh, take some blame for wanting new stuff all the time. Now, the opposite end of this also exists. The lifer, the, the person who takes one game or a small subset of games, and that becomes all they care about. Now, this is extremely common with miniature gamers and collectible card gamers, but it happens with all kinds of games. Like, I was a Catan lifer for a year or so, and before I found the board game Geek Top 100 and started discovering other games, 
There are a lot of people out there that find a game they love and stick with it without any interest in trying anything new. At this point in 2022, this is most likely the stage you're going to find the most gamers in when you broaden the scope to Magic, Warhammer, and Dungeons & Dragons. One of the advantages, though, of this, this being into one thing big with a bunch of other people that are into it big is the community that you don't get just being Epicurean playing different games every week. Uh, many people probably have tales about this stage uh, related to Magic in particular. Yeah. Uh, I know my wallet does. Um, <laughs> and, and there are different sort of uh, levels of this as well, you know, where I, I was playing board games, but my money was all in on magic. Yeah. Uh, you know, I would, it was RPGs and there was other games in my life, but financially I was all in on magic and there was a lot of magic being played even between yep. board games and, and, and RPGs we were playing. You know, if we had downtime, the deck of magic got pulled out. Yep, definitely true for our group. And I know people did both like like I some people in my regular game group play magic and and they had the whole thing where where they're like, oh, they discovered magic. Magic is awesome. Got to collect all the magic. And they stopped playing for a while and then they had a purge and they got rid of all their cards. But then someone invited them to a sealed deck night and they're like, oh, magic's fun. And they got back into it. Like I know someone that directly followed that path. But at the same time, they were playing board games, but they don't own a single board game. Like Sean said, they play mine. Now, the past we've talked about so far mainly deal with collecting, right? Being a board game collector, it's it's collecting, getting, as well as playing, playing different games. But nothing we've talked about yet is specifically what those games are, except specific games that fit into categories. There's also a life cycle for that, what games you're playing at a given time. And this one generally seems to revolve mostly around game weight. Now, when new to the hobby, most people are going to want to play games the same weight of whatever game they hook them, even if they have no idea what the term game weight means. They want to play games that scratch the same itch, right? Make you feel the same. They're just as challenging. And for the most part, this is what hobby gamers like to call gateway games. But it could really be all over the place. Like for me, I discovered Euro games, right? Or German games. Or it wasn't even Euro games when I discovered Catan. Everyone called them German games. And there's a reason for that. And I'm not going to get into it here, why they were called German games and why all these games did come out of Germany and the differences. We have a whole episode about the difference between East and West Euro games and Ameritrash. You're welcome to check that out. But anyway, I discovered Tan and learned that's a type of game that I had not discovered before. So then I started looking for other Euro games. And that led me to discovering something called the Spiel de Jar, which is the, the game of German Game of the Year Award. And then I realized that the publishers, Mayfair and Rio Grande, publish a lot of these games. So then I just started looking for games by those publishers. And then I learned there's a thing called the Aaliyah series. And they're published by all kinds of people, but it's a certain series of games that were kind of considered like the gold standard of Euro games. And there's a big box set and a low, small box set. My acquisition disorder went off and I tried to get them all. Now, I also started paying attention to designers. There's a point where I bought everything Claus Tuper put out because he was the person who designed Catan. And while everyone knows now, I'm a huge Stefan Feld fan. Uh, it also could just be in relation to other hobbies you have. Are you an environmentalist? Perhaps you enjoy games about safaris, birding, trees, or as we talked about earlier, hiking. Mm -hmm. uh, if your love of all things X got you into gaming, that's just as valid a reason as wanting to play some games like that as just wanting to play something more interesting than chess. Or in your own personal path, it was a mechanic, a specific mechanism style of game that you went and sought out more of now for other groups it seems to be similar though um with the internet being what it is today it's a lot easier to find what else would i enjoy i like this i play Catan. what other games like Catan are there what other games like wingspan are so newer groups may not be like going by publisher like when i'm saying going by publisher i'm like i walk into the game store and i look for the logo of the box right? Like it's kind of old school. Whereas nowadays, I think people are going to seek out games with similar weights, even if they don't know what weight means, right? They're going to get into the hobby through party games. They're going to start with code names, then they're going to learn about Beastie Bar, and then they're going to try out Guillotine and Parade. Um, I know one gamer who got in through 18xx and then played a different 18xx and then another 18xx, and then learned about Winsome Games and another 18xx, but then eventually branched into Hex Encounter War games to block war games and so on. And as Mo said, for me, it was the deck building. I, I liked magic, but I didn't want to get into a collectible card thing. I like building yep. decks and, and, and creating that engine and that deck that works. 
but I didn't want to get into collecting. And I found deck building as a mechanic scratched that itch. And mm -hmm. uh, it's something that I, I fell in love with. Now, for me, after discovering games like Catan, the whole Euro game thing, and trying out some of the other, like I had the board game Geek Top 10, right? So I tried an Ameritrash game on there and I didn't enjoy them as much. I found what I was enjoying was the challenge of playing games. I liked having to think and plan out my moves. And that had me start looking for heavier games. This is when I start discovering things like the BGG weight. And I start hearing terms like weight and heavy games and light games and crunchy games. And I, I played all of the Aaliyah games. So what's next? What's a step up, right? At this time, I discovered podcasts like Heavy Side, Heavy Cardboard, Ryan Metzler from the Dice Tower. Um, that led me to trying heavier games. And then when I found I enjoyed those and I played a bunch of them, I started looking for even heavier games, right? I started getting into stuff like Arkwright and splatter games like Indonesia. Now, at that point in my path, I had no interest in playing party games at all. I, I would even pass on older games that I used to consider heavy because they didn't feel heavy anymore, right? Like you just you're more used to it anymore. Like I wouldn't play Catan during that period and Race for the Galaxy. Oh, that's a simple game. I, on the other hand, while I enjoy certain heavy, meaty games, if the theme doesn't do anything for me, the game becomes of little interest. Uh, you show me a heavy brain burner sci-fi and I'm all in. But yeah. if we're haggling about the price of tulips and fighting for maximum profit, I'm just not going to be invested. What's this tulip game? I think he <laughs> might enjoy it. <laughs> so I actually think this one's pretty common, right? The, 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 like obviously, Sean did not quite go that way. But I think the, the, it's a pretty typical progression to start getting into heavier and heavier stuff, right? The stuff you originally learned don't feel as challenging or as interesting to you, and you need more of that meat, right? Uh, the entire term next deck games come from this and the popularity of people talking about next step games kind of shows that there is this progression worth making by moving up from easier games to more difficult ones. Now, I got to say some of this, I'm pretty sure is ego, right? Like, oh, I play heavy games. You definitely hear that. But honestly, for many people, it's the challenge of them. The heavier games, they feel more rewarding when you win, that you accomplish something that makes them fun. Uh, Tulip Mania, 1637. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I'm just amused because you can't see this, people. Oh, you can see it in the chat, but those listening live didn't see Deanna immediately reply, well, what? Wait, what? <laughs> yeah, so while there's nothing wrong if that path isn't for you, yeah. uh, I would say for the most part, that hasn't been my path at all, with oh. more mid-weight being where I'm happy at, aside from a few reaches of specific themed games, into mm -hmm. those, you know, heavier waters. I, I have no interest in Power Grid. <laughs> yeah. So I still kind of want you to play it. Just I know. So you I know, I'm to, I know I'm going to play it eventually, but it's possibly just, going just to, to get be that once. check mark. The, yeah. I have played Power Grid. And then you'll be like, wow, that was actually good, even though there was mm. pretty pasted on theme. <laughs> <laughs> and there's, there's a path that we haven't talked about. And I think some gamers go through is how important is theme to you and artwork and that. Um, you're going to shift from, I like heavily thematic games to, I like heavy crunch games. So I think for most people, that's not as much a back and forth. Like, I, I don't think people dive heavy into theme and they're like, oh, I'm sick of theme. I need to play more abstracts. But I think that's part of the journey while you're doing the other steps. You're probably at least going to try the different ones and find ones you prefer other others. Now, the heavy game, right? The climb, we're going up. Everything's getting heavier. Eventually, I hit a plateau. I, I couldn't tell you exactly when it was. Um, at some point, the heavier games started becoming less fun and started to feel like work. Uh, it started to feel like I was doing homework to play board games and even learning to play some of these games felt like work. Now, I honestly think this hit me when there was a lot of other stuff going on in my life and my game nights became more of a place to relax somewhere where I just wanted to do some silly fun and hang out with people. But no matter what the reason was, I hit a point where I was kind of sick of the heavier games. Like not only was I not interested in breaking out a calculator to play the final round of Arkwright, I was much more willing to sit down and play party games again. And that period was honestly somewhat eye opening. Like I was shocked when I'm like, you know what? I don't want to play anything. Let's just throw it. Whatever. Grab that stupid game. And I'm like, wow, that was actually fun. And, and I'm like, wow, I rediscovered games like like um, Rumble in the Dungeon, which is behind me here. 
I rediscovered the joy of simple dexterity games. And I like picked up a copy of Riff Raff off my friend Jamie. And it was a game I said I'd never play again at the time when he brought his copy over. And I'm like, I bought it off him and I loved it. I started playing Super Cats. Like it's a it's a game where you're basically playing rock, paper, scissors. It wasn't that long ago either, honestly. Like for anyone who listens to our podcast might even hear some of that transition. I think it was near the start of our podcast when all that was happening. If you've been here since the start, you got, probably got to hear me shift from talking about heavier games into lighter and lighter stuff. There's a reason we're reviewing Mountains over out of molehills tonight instead of uh, Shores of Tripoli. And it, it certainly helps when, if you've had a family, your kids get to a point of wanting yeah. to be involved. Uh, I don't think if you were just gaming with your usual Monday night group, you'd have had the same enjoyment of Super Cats as when you were able to watch your kids get really into mm. it. Yeah, very true. There was definitely the the playing games with the kids stage, which I hey, here we go. Here's a path, part of the path we both went through playing games with their kids, passing on the torch. Uh, you're going to sit there at some point where well, you're not necessarily some gamers are going to have kids and then you, they have a decision to make. Do they want to share their hobby with their kids? They probably do. We have many episodes about playing games with your kids. The important thing I'm going to reiterate here is don't force them. It should be optional. Do not force your kids to play games. There's no quicker way to make them hate family game night than forcing them to show up and take part. Um, having kids definitely makes a big change in your gaming life. From not necessarily being able to get together with your regular game group to playing different styles of games. Now, I think this whole progression of harder heavier harder i'm enjoying more and more think to okay i'm kind of sick of this i think this is pretty common i see a lot of board game podcasters reviewers media going through this um for a great public example of this right now all you have to do is follow eric lang on twitter and see his journey as a game designer where he went from games like blood rage rising sun and a song of fire and ice miniature games to designing the very chibi, silly-looking Marvel United and spending most of his time on Twitter advocating for lighter games that can be taught on four or less pages. Yeah, there can be a personal development aspect as well uh, that you'll somehow feel better if you can beat harder games, perhaps only to realize that the games you enjoy laughing around a table with friends, whatever weight those games may be, mm -hmm. end up being the better games. Now, personally, I where I am right now, I would say is a happy medium as far as game weights are. I still like games with some meat, and I would say mid to heavy weight euros are pretty much my favorite still. I like I'm not too heavy style side, you know, the threes and then in the board game, the three to three point fives, maybe reaching up a little higher. But I do occasionally love having a party game night where I'm playing games with a weight of one where I don't have to think too much. And then I can take those really heavy games. What I like to do with those is plan a specific game night. Plan ahead. We're going to play something big and meaty with a group of people who enjoy meaty games. So who knows? Three months from now, I might be on a heavy game kick and all about picking up the latest Vital Reserta game and playing that until uh, the dice are worn out. I dice give it till December. Game. Just a hunch. <laughs> there you go. So the whole thing here, though, is that this transition and shifting in all aspects are is normal this is what happens That's why we call it a journey not a straight path we said this 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 isn't a straight path and it's not a bad thing it's perfectly normal to uh, go backwards uh to purge your entire collection only to regret it and try to rebuild it again uh to move away from silly games that don't mean anything to games where you can outwit no play your opponents and feel good about it only to swap back to silly games where you flush toilets or flip airplanes to knock over chickens there's really no right way to approach this hobby except to try to have fun and make sure you aren't impacting the fun of others while doing so. So those are the ones we have noted down, but there is another one I have to call out that is a pretty obvious path that Sean and I are on right now. And that is at some point, maybe you take this hobby so seriously, you become a content creator. You like your game so much, you want to share them with the world so much, you start shouting out to the public to pay attention to you and what you know about games so that hopefully more people will discover this awesome hobby. This one obviously isn't for everyone. And as far as I can tell, based on most trends, doesn't last. It's a phase and people get out of it. They jump in and then they pod fade pretty quickly. 
based on our uh, podcaster list, we have at tabletopbellhop.com, we have a list of master, a master list of tabletop gaming podcasts. I am trying to purge it. It is 1,500 line items long, and it's taking a very long time. I'm maybe a third of the way through. The number of podcasts I have had to delete because they have no content out has been staggering. It's about 50-50 if a show that is on that list is still live now, which is why I need to clean it up. Now, I will admit a lot of those are actual plays. RPG actual plays tend to last about a year, and that's about it. And then either they move on to something else or pod fades. But still, there are a lot of people doing what we do. A lot of people get to this stage, but not a lot stick with it. Honestly, I don't expect to quit anytime soon. We have no plans to end. But like popular podcasts that we grew up with uh, are gone. Gaming and BS probably being the most recent one. Yeah, and, and I think a lot of people sort of uh, misunderstand content creation. Uh, there are a lot of myths about content creation, including the money available, um, <laughs> yeah. which which isn't there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you have to do this for the love. And what I think a lot of people um, who aren't, you know, listeners from the beginning, at least, might not know is just how long you've been doing this. While Tabletop Bellhop is still oh, yeah. reasonably new. We're only, you know, we're, we're still under 200 episodes. Uh, yep. The Windsor Gaming Resource, which was the original uh, iteration of your online uh, content creation persona, yeah. goes way, way back. <laughs> yeah, You've been doing this a long time 20 years. In, 20 years. in its two forms. Yeah, um, 20 years ago, I launched the Windsor Gaming Resource web page which was I, it was early it's been more than 20 years at this point because early in the year and what originally it was is i had discovered rss feeds and there were a number of good board game news sites out there board game geek being one of them but there were others at the time that were really good and i wanted all the information in one place and i made a list of the local game stores where you could buy games because this was the point where i discovered Catan, and it was information i wanted that didn't exist and that's where it came from was I didn't want to be my dad. I didn't want to be sitting in the basement with these games and not sharing them with people. And I knew other people were out there. So I wanted to get people to get together and play games. And shortly after launching, I hosted my first game event. We started doing game events at Hugin and Munin, and it's just gone on since. Yeah, it's it's a shame we didn't pivot to uh, podcasting sooner. Well, yeah, um, and Sean, Sean pushed me like <laughs> way back, way yeah. back. And I, I, I you know, it. again, we we. You know, it's it's not unthinkable because of the head start you had that we couldn't have been one of the big names. Um, yeah. I'm not saying we ever would have had cruises, but uh, <laughs> it's true. But, uh, you know, there there's there's there was enough ramp up time and we were digital early enough that we could have. Uh, we, we could. Have, although, although I personally think if we had started back then with everything that went on in my life between then and now, we would have quit. We possibly. wouldn't still be here. <laughs> there, there were some who knows if if i was talking games every night maybe some of the stuff that happened wouldn't happen <laughs> I, don't, I don't know I'm, I'm not a big regret look back for what could have been person yep. all i will say is we're not going anywhere now um this is definitely a path that many gamers take now of course there's a minor version right there's the post all your games on twitter make an instagram account make a tumblr whatever's out there make tiktok videos you don't have to have a podcast you don't have to do reviews you don't have to become um a, a, a content creator you can share your love of video games and a lot of people do that nowadays but they do that with every hobby that's that's not board game specific in any particular way so that's, then oh, yep. no no nope, no nope, then okay. there's one more stage that oh, we haven't oh, okay. gotten to is getting work in the industry becoming a a, a board game professional oh, no we are not professionals as you can probably tell by our quality mm -hmm. and 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 of, of our subtitles for one down below um you design games, I, a fairly logical progression. So here's an interesting one. There are a lot of people out there that assume everyone who plays games seriously and takes it seriously wants to design their own game. I'm here to tell you, no, I have no interest in designing a board game. For some reason, people think that's like the logical step is you do this, you play all these games, and then you make your own game and you get rich, which no, you don't trust me. <laughs> Just like there's not a lot of money in content creation. There's not a lot of money in creating games either. The select few who have very popular games, it happens. Um, so that is a step that we have not taken. I have written RPGs. I am much more interested in writing role-playing games than I am writing board games. I have no interest in developing a board game. 
at one time I had an idea for deck shedding as a mechanic, but other people already took that and ran with it and did good stuff with it. All right. Well, uh, as our chat room knows, the final stage will be porridge, but I'll leave you to find that out on your own. Yeah. So that's it for our talk of the life cycle of a gamer. Do your experiences match our own? What was your tabletop journey and what stage would you say you're in now? Let us know by commenting below, hit us up on social media, or send us an email. Remember, we're here to answer your gaming and game night questions. Tonight happened to be a question from Razowell. Next week could be a question from you. To get your questions to us, head over to tabletopbellhop.com. Click on Ask the Bellhop at the top of the page. Fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or hit me up on social media where I can be found everywhere. It's tabletop, bellhop, one word. Welcome to our review of Mountains Out of Mole Hills, a programmed movement game with fantastic table presence. Mm -hmm. Before we get uh, going, a big shout out to the op for providing us with a review copy of this game. Thanks, op. So Mountains Out of Mole Hills was designed by Jim D. Camillo and Patrick Marino. Features artwork by Elena Munoz. Now, as Sean just mentioned, this one comes from the op and was just published this year. So, yes, sometimes we do talk about the new hotness here. Mountains Out of Mole Hills plays two to four players. The more, the better, with games taking about an hour each quicker with less players. The game has an MSRP of $39.99 US which is a great point for the production quality involved. Now, in Mountains Out of Mole Hills, players take on the role of a mole who's trying to be king of the hill by controlling the most mole hills. This is done through the use of a card-driven program movement system on a two-tiered board, where every move forward causes a mound of dirt to be pushed upwards and placed on the second tier of the board. After each of six rounds, moles will score points for the hills they control, those having their clumps at the bottom. There's also a neat toppling system for when the hills get too tall to stand. One of the highlights of this game is its production quality and table presence. The two-tiered board system uses the game box in a way that really makes the game stick out. A great place to see this is through our Mountains of Mole Hills unboxing video on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Now, the board design here really does sound out and is sure to get people's attention. It's not just that, though. The acrylic mole standees are really nice, and the somewhat rubbery dirt mounds all add to this table presence. Other components include a set of movement cards, which are fairly small but easy to shuffle due to that size, some turn tokens, a rock token, and a scoring pad. Now, one nice touch is that everything came punched already, so you did have to assemble the standees. Now, be aware, with the standees, they do each have a film on one side that needs to be removed, and this isn't really evident when looking at them. Now, there's also a custom silk screen six-sided die for determining what happens when a mole hits a rock. There is also, of course, a rule book, which I found to be very clear, well-organized, and even offers background fluff for people who care exactly which species of mole they're playing. The game really does look and feel great. It's designed in a way that the height of the two boards actually makes it easy to say, see both layers at once, and mm -hmm. design elements like the X and Y axes make it easy to see what square is over what. The mole hill mounts stack well and come apart easily, though you do need a bit of dexterity to make sure you don't knock over any others while placing new mounts, especially later in the game when some of the stacks are five high. Now, I really have no complaints at all about the production quality here. Though I gotta say that film is hard to spot and not easy to get off, but you know what? It's a one-time thing you do when you first open the game. Now that we have a good idea of what you are getting with Mountains Out of Mole Hills, how about you give us an overview of play? Okay, so the first step in playing Mountains Out of Mole Hills is assembling this two-tiered board. Now, this is easy enough, and the game boards are two-sided, one side being used for a two-player game, and the other being used for three or four. Now, the big thing to watch for here is that you orientate the two boards facing the same way so the coordinate system lines up. Next, everyone picks a mole and is assigned a player token randomly. Starting with the first player, everyone places their mole on an edge square facing whatever way they want. Then they place one mound of dirt above where their mole is standing, and that's it for setup. Now, a game of Mountains Over Mole Hills is then played over six rounds. 
Each round starts by randomly laying out five movement cards per player. Once they're out in player order, players will draft cards one at a time until they have four total. This will leave one card per player left at the end, which are then discarded. Now, one interesting thing we discovered after our first four player game is that when playing with the maximum player count, every single card in the game will be used. They won't all be drafted, but they will co all come up for draft. And I noted during the unboxing, wow, this is a big stack of cards. I wonder why? Well, that's exactly why. Now, once everyone has their four cards, they're then going to put them in order. You're going to make a stack showing what four actions you're going to take from top to bottom. Now, the order here is important because all players will take the action on their top card first, then the card under that, and then the card under that, all the way to the bottom card. Now, once a player has their moves planned out, they place their turn order token on top to indicate this. Once everyone's token has been placed, it's time to find out what happens. So everyone flips over to their top movement card and then they're resolved in player order. Now these movement cards include a few different things. There are your basic move forward, either one, two or three spaces, turn left and move cards, turn right and move cards, turn either direction cards, U-turn cards, U-turn and move cards, rock cards and mole cards. Now while most of these are pretty straightforward, it's worth noting that the turn and U-turn and move cards let you do these actions in either order. Mm -hmm. The rock card lets you place the rock token anywhere on the board or move it anywhere if it's already up. If a mole later moves onto the rock, they roll the rock die to see which way the disoriented mole ends up facing. The mole cards represent your mole peeking their head above ground. When this happens, they topple the hill above them. More about topples in a second. Now, every time a mole moves forward, they push up a bit of dirt up top, which is represented by the player taking one of those mound tokens on the board and putting it at the bottom of an existing hill, either putting it on the board or at the bottom. Remember, this mound does go to the bottom, which I noticed people playing tend to want to just stack them on top. No, no, you're pushing dirt up from the bottom. So talk about theme fitting mechanics. No, no mounds are played if your mole doesn't move. So this includes turning in place, doing a U-turn, placing a rock, or using that mole card to peek. Now, movement in this game is friendly. While you are competing with your moles, you are, you're, you're all good friends and are very polite. If there's a mole in the, way, in the way, when you go to move, you just patiently sit and wait, losing any further movement. Similarly, if you try, find yourself trying to move to a wall, instead you just go as far as you can, and, well, we already talked about rocks earlier. If you hit one, you randomly change direction. Now, just because it's friendly doesn't mean you won't be trying your hardest to cut off your opponents, and I'm sure they'll be doing the same to you. Now, the one thing left to talk about is toppling. Each round has a different topple limit, which starts at two but goes up to five. After you move, if any hills are taller than this limit, they topple them. You'll topple them one at a time in the order they were created. Now, to topple a hill, you take all the mounds off the top, leaving the bottom mound behind. You then pick a cardinal direction to topple in, and then add one mound to each hill in that direction for each block you pulled off, starting with the bottom block and moving up. Now, mounds that topple off the map are returned to their players. Now, note, a topple can also happen due to someone playing a mole card. In this case, the hill topples no matter what the height is. Mm -hmm. Also, a topple can create another topple, leading to a chain reaction where each topple is fully resolved before moving on to the next one. Now, once all players completed all four of their moves, the round ends. At this point, a new player order is determined. This is done by looking down at the top of the board and counting how many mounds are visible on top for the player. The player with the most mounds visible becomes first player, moving downwards from there. Now, player order can be very important in this game due to the fact that the first player gets to draft first, which can be huge. But there's also an advantage going later when moving in order to be the last person able to steal some hills right before scoring. Now, speaking of scoring, that's the next part. At this point, players get one point for every mound in every hill they control. You control a hill if your mound is at the bottom. Remember, each move pushes up. At the end of six rounds, the player with the most points wins. Draft cards, put cards in order, play out the round and build hills, score those hills and repeat six times. Pretty straightforward, but is it too simple? Let's move on to our final thoughts. 
So when the op was awesome enough to reach out to us and see if we were interested in checking out Mountains on a Molehills, I wanted to say yes as soon as I saw it. The table presence here is really striking. And as someone who runs public play events, my first thought was this would be great for playing at a public place, a coffee shop or a legion, a Knights of Columbus, a library, anywhere there's going to be non-gamers around. As soon as you were unboxing this, I knew you'd love it for those public play events. Yeah. Games that are not only good, but catch the eye and bring people in are the perfect ones for public events and getting more players hooked on board games. Now, at the time, though, our pile of obligation was growing. And due to the pandemic, I'm not running any public play events right now. So I decided to dig deeper and not just go for it. Now, the big discovery for me and what sold me on trying this game was my first thing I discovered was it's a programmed movement game. I love programmed movement games. Robo Rally is one of my favorite games of all time, and probably that'll never change. I love Lords of Zidit. My favorite part of Wonder Woman Challenge of the Amazon is how you planned out your actions and so on. As soon as I learned this was a program movement game, that's what got me to say yes. It's always interesting what mechanics different people are drawn to. Now, the one thing I couldn't figure out doing that research, and even after reading the rules, is what kind of game is this? I figured Mountains on the Molehills would be one of two things. It was either going to be a highly strategic abstract strategy game up there with games like Azul or Yinch. Or it would be a silly family game with lots of chaos and very little actual strategy and tactics required. Turns out it ended up being somewhere in between. Yeah, because what you have here is a game where you do need to pay attention, especially to the turn order and what other players are drafting. There's bits of predicting what your opponents are going to do, as well as even bluffing while trying to mislead your opponents. All things a good abstract strategy game will have. But then there's a pretty high randomness fact. All your plans can be ruined if the right cards don't come up and the rock rules with its die system for changing directions adds some real chaos to the game. Even with two players, your moles are going to get in each other's way. And with the friendly movement rules, that can often lead to turns where you do nothing. Now, all of these factors can combine. So there are actual entire rounds where you do nothing. And that's going to turn off some players. As we discussed after your first game, the confluence of events that led to that first play being less than the best showing for the game. Agreed. Now, the secret I found to enjoying Mountains on a Mole Hills is to realize that these things happen and embrace it, to laugh about it. Realize this is a silly family game, it has aspects of take that and silly gameness, and still, though, try to play as strategically as you can. The strategy game elements here really are solid. And I got to say, pulling off an end of round three move that steals three tall stacks from the point leader can be highly rewarding. But you have to be willing to accept that your big three move steal can be thwarted by a mole moving in your way or a rock placed in your path. And it's not, it's not really as much a take that as a take what comes. Yeah. Uh, the ability to correctly guess a maneuver into a position in a program movement game like this is actually staggeringly small. Yet. It happens by accident all the time. Mm -hmm. Now, that said, even when you do embrace the chaos, having a round when you can do nothing isn't ideal in any game. Now, when it's another player that caused it, sure, that's fine, right? You can laugh about it like, oh, I totally got cut off. But when it's the fact the cards that came up just don't work for you at all, that it can be a bit frustrating. Now, part of this, I will admit, is learning the game. This is something I didn't have on my first play, and I saw much better by my fourth. And making sure you're in a position at the end of the round where you won't get stuck is actually important. So you want to be in a spot where no matter what comes up in the cards, you should be OK. But even for accounting that we have had rounds where no straights come up or no turns come up at all. We even had a turn where there was only one movement card and the rest were moles and rocks. I'm sure the odds of that are extremely low, but it happened in a three player game. Now, this unfortunate occurrence is, of course, minimized with more players, meaning more cards to draft from. Yeah, definitely. This problem is much worse at lower player counts. Uh, we've never actually had a problem with four players. I've never had it where every player couldn't get at least a move or at least a turn. But it did come up with three players, and it came up fairly often with two. Now, you can just take this as part of the game. But I personally suggest 
adding some kind of house rule to avoid this. And no, me, Tabletop Bella, Mo, I am not one to mess with game rules. I like to play games by the raw, but in this game, I really do think it could help. Now, what this rule is would totally depend on your group. Ideas to talk about could be making sure there's at least one turn or um, one turn or one straight per player in the card reveal. So if you're playing four players, there has to be at least four turns and four straights. Or do it, and, and you can do that by doing a mulligan, right? Wiping and redrawing. Or maybe you keep drawing cards from the deck until you get those up, but then you're going to go through the deck more than once. Or maybe you can take cards from the discard pile as long as it's not the first game of the, the, the first pull of the game. Another one that I think is a, a valid way to do it might be to allow players to use any card as a turn or any card as a move or a move forward one as long as they don't have another one, right? In that case, you'd have to probably make them reveal their hand to prove they don't have one. But then you get into, were they able to draft one? And I I, I worry that rule could be abused, but it might work. Yeah, even though we're not generally house rule fans, I think a mulligan for no movement cards is a completely acceptable alteration and perhaps something that should have been included in the rules. Now, when you don't have any movement cards available, when you don't have this problem, when sorry, when you don't have any movement card availability problems, when you don't have this problem, the game works great. It, it shines. This is actually a really great programmed movement. Um, turns out it's kind of an area majority game. Well, it really is. That has fantastic table presence. I love the acrylic standees. They, they work really well in the, the fact that one of the things you have to track is which way they're facing. And the standees are great for that. Um, they also look really cool. Uh, the, I, there's something about translucent acrylic standees that honestly looks better than cardboard uh the material they use for the dirt mounds is great and you won't understand this until you touch them they're just not they're not fragile they're not hard plastic you can tell they're not going to chip or break they stack really well together but don't stack too well um now i would say i kind of wish they were a little wider because they don't take up a full square but then you got to get your fingers in i don't know i would like them to be a little more stable but that's a minor issue I mean, they are meant to topple, but not quite in such a literal way. <laughs> yeah, actual toppling. There's no dexterity of making things topple, though. I got to say, that would be a neat game in its own. Now, I found Mountains Out of Mole Hills did scratch that programming movement itch for me. Personally, I think I would have enjoyed it a bit more if it was a bit more strategic and less random. But my kids, on the other hand, love it exactly how it is. Now, my one, my older daughter, is all about planning ahead and long-term goals. He's excellent at making sure she stays first player and has developed this double back strategy that serves her really well. That is until her mean father comes around at the end of the last round and steals all her stacks and thanking her for all her hard work. That's only happened a couple of times. Now, my younger daughter, on the other hand, loves the chaos. If there's a rock card, she's going to draft it and she's going to end up putting it in the most annoying place possible. You will purposely move and block another mole, even if it's not what seems like the best move at the time, and she loves toppling those hills. Now, our friends Tori and Kat both thought this was really cool and have asked to play it again. Deanna, on the other hand, who's the heavy gamer in our family, will play when asked, but the randomness just frustrated. Yeah, I can certainly see playing it now and then, but I suspect I'm a little bit more towards D-stance, especially as I don't have a deep love for program movement as a mechanic, unlike yourself. Now, one thing that has come up in some of our gameplays with other people is that the game feels like it might be a bit longer than they'd like. Now, for my youngest daughter, it's maybe one round too long due to her expansion span. By the last round, I've noticed she's not really paying nearly as much attention as more playing randomly. Um, now, my wife found the two middle rounds where the hill height doesn't change kind of felt like they were just put in there to make the game longer because you end up playing like two rounds with a height of three and two rounds with a height of four. Um, Personally, I will admit our first two games did feel a bit long, but once I was playing with people who knew the game and I was able to teach a little better, it seemed to flow much quicker and it felt to be about the perfect length. So it's possible that first game with the end of that felt too long was just because we were also trying to learn the game. Now, I'll admit of all those plays, I played every one. So for me, I have the most experience playing the game, but and every other game I played was with someone who didn't know. So that might be why it kind of drugged out. Uh, but I will say other people do see that it might just be a little bit too long. But again, too long and just the game feels like it went around too long. Like an hour is not too long for a game. They felt it should be, I I think because of the randomness and the chaos, you generally want that in shorter games. It's more acceptable in a shorter game. Whereas a longer game with the chaos can be a little thing. Again, I did not find this problem myself, but um, 
played with other people and what they thought is just as valid. Fair enough. And we do know that getting people to play a game multiple times in the first place anymore is just getting harder and harder. Mm. Overall, Mountains Out of Mole Hills is an awesome looking, quick playing, family weight, programmed movement, area majority game with fantastic components and very clear rules. It has a fascinating balance between a strategic abstract strategy game and a chaotic silly kids game, which actually I think overall makes it surprisingly appealing for a wider range of gamers. I think you're going to get more people interested in this than if it was just a heavy strategy game or just a silly kids game. Mountains on a molehill is a game my kids will happily sit down together and play, and a game I can just as easily break out with my experienced game group. While it may not be for everyone, especially people who are into real strategy and tactical play who are rewarded for their play, I think this one's going to appeal to many game groups. It's important to note that I think while this game could easily, on a first glance, be discarded as something frivolous, like something mm -hmm. from the 80-90s era Mattel Parker Brothers uh, where gimmicks like Shark Attack, Forbidden Bridge, or Pimple Pete uh, were a big thing. It's not that. No. And that there is a real game here worthy of a hobby collection. Now, I think the big place this game is going to shine and stand out is a great game for local gaming events, public play, game stores, game cafes, anyone who runs public play events, playing in a public park. This is the kind of game that can gather a crowd with people coming up and going, oh, what's that? I am certain I can hook at least one stranger playing this with this game out on the table at one of the Windsor Gaming Resource events. Well, that's it for our Mountains Out of Mole Hills uh, uh, review. A game with great table presence that is much more than just a pretty gimmick to look at. Yeah. Now, what's a game in your collection that you think has a great table presence? Let us know about it in the comments. Now, before I go, I also want to invite you to check out my written review of Mountains Over. Um, over. That just, I, I get it right for the whole review until the very end. Mountains Over Mole Hills would be a, a, something different. Before I go, I just want to invite you to check out my written review of Mountains Out of Mole Hills, which will be posted over at tabletopbellhop.com and will feature lots of pictures of this great looking game. And now, the Bellhops Tabletop, where we look features. back at games we played since last episode. No features for this features. one. Features. Oh, I don't know. It's one of those weeks. Should have cracked open a beer instead of a coffee. <laughs> All right, so the nasty cold that's ripped through my family uh, is still, uh, it's, it's getting better. Um, both kids are back in school at least, but because of that, there hasn't been a lot of gaming. Uh, despite the fact that D and I are probably up for a game night, we didn't want to invite anyone over or go out in public or risk spreading this to anyone else. So I'm halfway through the move, and next time you see me, I should be recording from the new office space. And we, we need people to bet on what the first game we play together is. So there you go, fans of the show. <laughs> we you go. want to get something in by next week, place a bet on what game Sean and I will play first once he's down here. Um, so due to all the appointments and people sick and staying home, the main thing I have been playing this last week is Pocketbook Adventures. Um, finally past the first boss, um, now into the second section of the game, which features puzzle movement. Uh, this is the slider puzzle thing where you just you move in a straight line until you hit something, and then you pick a new direction to go and you go in a straight line until you hit something. Um, this has proven harder than I expected. And most importantly, that I think I, I kind of wish I'd called out in the review, I can cause a lot of AP, which I, I realize AP is really only a problem with multiple players. But I found that once I'm in these puzzle ones, I am spending a lot of time up front trying to plan out my moves before doing anything. Like sometimes even figuring out my entire path before making that first move. And I think any puzzle fan or fans of heavier games are probably going to end up playing this that way. I, I, I this game feels more and more like a Sudoku crossword puzzle yep. uh, sort of experience. Uh, the more I hear about it. Yeah, it definitely is. It's definitely like like a pencil. Game. It's a like games magazine. It scratches that same itch that I used to get buying games magazine. Now, one reason I think I'm having a harder time with this and not just like just, you know, do it, get off the pot. Um, The first boss fight did not go well. So so I beat it easy enough. That was fine. But I skipped over pretty much all the treasure doing so. And that game, I honestly just kind of went for it. And I think I was punished for not planning things out. 
I was just like, there's this thing with treasures or sorry, traps thing, interesting things with traps where you can hurt the boss with traps. And I was way more focused on making sure that I used the traps and I like missed out on all the rewards. And I think because of that, I'm like, oh, you know, I need to spend more time planning when I'm playing this instead of, you know, I'm just like in the car. I'll go this way. I'll go this way. I'll go this. Oh, I target. Oh, let's do this. And then I'm like, oh, it's dead. Well, it's good that it's dead. But like, I didn't get the chest. I didn't get the pile of coins. I didn't get the key. I didn't I didn't get all the stuff. So um, now these aren't bad. I'm, I'm not trying to bash the game. I, I still have a pretty resounding love for this game. And I think everyone should back it. But just it, it did change. It was interesting how different the second field is from the first field well i think and i I think you definitely sort of came at it from one angle um and that wasn't the angle of the sudoku crossword game players yeah Um, i was thinking more rpg yeah you've been you've been away from you've been away from those games magazines for quite a while they don't make that they don't publish that stuff anymore they did Um, someone take up the mantle but um so so now and then you've now gotten yourself back into that mindset and yeah. so you're playing it differently as a result yeah i'm sure that's probably part of it now again anyone who's here live uh you still got some time it ends sometime thursday sometime tomorrow he already um, posted I, the link in the chat room yeah he's got the link in the chat nice um what i don't know is if they're planning on any late pledge or pre-order or backer kit or something so this could be your last chance um for those catching up on the show after that it is worth checking to see if there is a way to still back um, just check out our review from our last episode for way more info on why. Absolutely. Uh, the other thing I played this past week was a three-player game of Mountains Out of Molehills because I didn't want to do a review without trying the game at all the player counts. Um, it worked. It worked fine. But we did have a round where we basically did nothing because of the card play. So it's a thing. And I, and I don't know if we're lucky when our four-player games that it hasn't happened or if we're just unlucky in our lower player count games. But, like, I'm scared of playing that two-player. Now, one of the things that did happen is the op heard me not complain, but mentioned that I didn't enjoy two players. They're like, oh, it's super cutthroat two-player, blah, blah, blah. So they think, like, it's not like they're trying to mass market it to more people, though maybe that's just someone with marketing experience going on. Um, They seem to think that it's very cutthroat two-player. So, I don't know, part of it, I'm like, I kind of want to try two-player again. But then D didn't really enjoy it, so I forced her to play two-player. So what I really want to do is I want to convince the kids to sit down and play each other two player and see how that goes. Like just sit and watching. I can take some pictures. Maybe I'll actually take videos for like TikTok or what do they call it on YouTube? The thing we're not doing that that we should do to become famous scenes, snips, something, whatever they're called. It's interesting. Uh, The uh, the vote, the vote split on player count for mountains and molehills uh, for two player is split three ways. Best Ah. recommended and not recommended. (laughs) <laughs> wow, best and not. See, I would say not at this point, but yeah, I, I'll admit uh, we only tried it once. Whereas but it was bad everyone who has voted for four players has been had voted it for best. Best, yeah. yeah. I like at this point it felt better. The one thing here's a complaint I didn't want to throw in the in the the review because it, it not petty, but it wasn't that big a deal. So there's two sided board. The one side has a two player board. Then there's the other side that's for three and four. When you play three or four, you only use part of the board. There's rows you don't use. Well, on the top board, those rows you don't use are like dirt. There's nothing on the bottom board to indicate not to use those. And I'm just like, why? Like, like put them in shadow, put rocks there. Because like the, the art on the board doesn't matter. It would have been really nice to have some kind of reminder for three player. Don't use these because multiple times playing three players. I think all three of us did it at least once. We tried to move somewhere without realizing, oh, shoot, that's a wall. Uh, other than that, I got some boxes to open, but I have not played anything else. Um, I did. I, I, I Did I mention this last week? I can't remember if it was last week. I played Hades and got to see all the things. There was a lot more things on that oh, screen yes. I was you're, missing yes. than I thought. Like yeah, way more you're, stuff. You're, I didn't yeah, even know. I, I didn't. I, it was weird watching it. watching you play, knowing that there's information that you like lots more than i thought i thought it was like little bits like how much gold i had no no not like my heat up in the corner and stuff yeah our our old tv i don't know why it was a sony and i was using sony products on it and it should have worked yeah no for some reason you had your extents were just completely wrong yeah and Uh, even though i could change them like i could go into a game and say make it this big and it didn't do anything um so yeah 
Um, that was it was it was a a shocking difference. Plus, man, the game just looked better, right? It just flowed better, and I played better. And I'm like, I don't know, it's bigger, so I'm playing better. It's just <laughs> I needed a break, but man, I kicked butt. Like I I finished two <laughs> runs, my first run with five heat with the laser, right? Which I know you've probably gotten further. I haven't been playing that much at all, so I played that, um, video game wise. But that's it. Like I, I Deanna has been playing. Deanna has been working her way through Nino Kuni which is the only video game I think I've ever bought multiple times. Oh, no, there was a Katamari I bought twice. Yeah. Um, we had it on the PlayStation 3 and loved it. It's it's literally you're playing a Miyazaki movie. Like like the the tone, the art style, the voice acting, the the wholesomeness of it. You are playing a Miyazaki movie. Very Final Fantasy style with the Overland map and random fights against monsters. There's, of course, a Pokemon aspect because every game needs to have that now where you collect various familiars. And you can breed them and all this stuff. But Deanna has been playing that. And the writing in that game is fantastic. Far too many repetitive battles for my taste. Um, oh, that's the other one I should call out. I I tried Marvel Snap. Yep, I get why people are hooked. Mm. It, it's pretty good. I yeah. will say if anyone's interested in never playing Marvel Snap, join now. Because there's a whole bunch of like founder stuff you get. It's a free app. Yeah. It's, it's freemium. It's free. If you are interested in playing, join now just so you can get the free stuff. That you know you won't be able to get lighter. Fair, yeah, no, I that one I just saw a bunch of people talking about it, but I've never really been in on the freemium uh, Marvel yeah, games. I, still, I know you've been, still, you've been, you've been, you've been Quest. Yeah, 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 you were a huge. We fan. still Marvel Puzzle Quest. I play every day. I have been playing Snaps. It it is it is um, I don't want to say better, but it's Smash Up. Like it's it's literally Smash Up. There are three bases. You're trying to play up to four cards at each base and have the most power. Right. The thing is, your deck's only 10 cards, and it's only six rounds long. So it's, like, super tight and quick, right. which Smash Up does not have. <laughs> I'm not trying to cut up Smash Up too much here, but I, I'm enjoying it more than Smash Up. Mm. And right, you well, play real people. You're right. not playing an AI, which is well, nice. Good. Well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? Uh, so Deanna and I are heading out of town. I have no clue what I'm going to pack. Uh, we don't know if there'll be a table in the room, so... I, 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 Deanna, to Deanna's chagrin, I, every trip I tend to pack these either Julius Caesar or Twilight Imperium, and uh, we will play a heavy game, but then we tend to do brewery tours, so these games don't always get played. But now and then we've been on these trips where we have a day where we take it easy, and, and I'm going to bring it just in case. So I am looking forward to trying to get either Julius Caesar or, or Twilight Imperium. I'm th- or Twilight Struggle. Sorry, Twilight Struggle, not Twilight Imperium. <laughs> Bringing Twilight Imperium camping. You need a, you know, we're just going to get, we're gonna get two, for you. We're going to get two, uh, two queen size beds, yes. one to sleep on and one to play Twilight Imperium on. Uh, Twilight Imperium is definitely a canoe game because you can use the box as a canoe <laughs> if, if, <laughs> if things don't go well. Um, <laughs> a two player date night Twilight Imperium. No, Twilight Struggle, the the for for years was the number one game on board Game Geek. Um Julius Caesar is a block war game that's similar to Hammer of the Scots, and we loved Hammer of the Scots. I'd say love, but it's been like 10 years since I played it. It's <laughs> on that list of I need to play it again. Right. I'm like, I gotta stop recommending this game. Fond memories of, be. but you don't actually know if it's a good game or not. Yeah, exactly. At this point, I don't even know. I remember I used to like it. Been there. Um, so we'll bring the other there'll probably be some Duke, because there's usually some Duke um uh we are going to at least two breweries so i will bring micro brewers brew crafters the last time we did that we didn't actually play it so i'm like i kind of want to do that in theory until we're there hanging out and just having a good time chatting and then i'm like i don't do i want to bring out brew crafters (laughs) nah um now i do have two more boxes to unbox and actually you know what i got a third bonus one we're gonna do just because because it's 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 on topic in a way um i didn't get to unbox any of the stuff i got last week so now there's a pile like, like we, I don't know. <laughs> I'm starting to feel like we need an acquisition disorder section of the show. That's a section from the secret cabal where they talk about like, well, what have you been playing? What are you excited about? And they're like, what'd you get this week? <laughs> we could start doing that again. It feels like lately. Yeah. Um, packages have been coming left and right. It's one of those I, I, I held off for a long time. And then I might've gone a little overboard on the saying, yes, we'll see. Yep. Um, I, we're, I, I'm, I'm sure right now it's mainly publishers trying to get stuff out time for Christmas. So. Yep. We'll see if we fit them all in. Um, I am at the point now because I did agree to one today where I'm like, look, I have a pile. I, if you're at all concerned about timing, I, I'll just say no. I'll be nice and say we probably won't get to it. And they're like, no, 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 whenever you get to it. So, And in a positive note, we are now working with Inside Up Games again and Connor Magui, um, who we reviewed Goris Maximus for in the Yay. past. 
but that was because we were able to meet up at Origins. Well, this one's actually getting shipped. So I'm happy to get stuff from someone who I don't have to meet in person. Um, and I did not that we up. have anything wrong with meeting people in person. No, there's well, just we a do, pandemic. There's a still. pandemic. Yes. Uh, the global you, you pandemic. It sounds like, oh, I don't want to meet people. Uh, no, no. no. I, I, for the last few years, I haven't wanted to meet people, and yeah. I'm still not quite there yet. Now for a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Mechanical Muse. Thank you. Ron F. From the Ron Talks Tabletop Podcast. Thank you. Roger Malosh, whose game design work can be found at Roger Dodger Games. That's R-O-G-E-R-D-O-G-E-R Games. Kevin Reno. Thanks, Tech. And Brian Sheehan. Thanks, Brian. Well, that was the double bell. Uh, that means my shift's coming to an end and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors are closed, you can always find us at tabletopbellhop.com, all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word, and on your podcatcher of choice. I also invite you to head over to patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop and tip your bellhops. That wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. Thank you, lobbyists, for joining us. You're welcome to stick around in the penthouse for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And And game game on. on.